that God's done for me. I was thinking back on this year and thinking of his blessings and uh, things have happened, but uh, he's blessed me more. And uh, that's what I was thinking about, uh, about regarding my uh, oldest son that we're having uh, such a time with his health and everything. And so uh, he calls me and he says, uh, he said, Mom, I, uh, I know something's real bad wrong with me. And I said, yeah. I said, uh, it may be. I said, we're really, you know, not sure now, but it may be. But I can promise you one thing and don't you ever forget it. God is bigger than whatever it is. And uh, so when you old as I am, 78, uh, you, you know that you're, and you know that you're, you're anchored into something so marvelous. And, and the older you get, the more, I guess, you think about what God has done, what God is, and what God has done for you and your whole family. And uh, we raised those kids when they were little until uh, they got grown with uh, no uh, doctors or anything. And uh, God's always taken care of it. And I great, uh, uh, you know, told him about that yesterday. So uh, I just want you to pray as we go through this. I, uh, I thought about this song. Somebody says, well, you shouldn't sing such a sad song. Well, it's not a sad song to me. I said, this song uh, gives me hope and uh, and one of our favorite people in the world love this song, Eloise. <laughs>
If you would like to make an offering to the Lord, we have an offering plate in the back and one up here on the Lord's table. You can do that before or after the services. We don't pass the plates, but we are very thankful to you all for giving. And uh, I'm just telling you, God has blessed this church and there must be mighty things getting ready to happen in 2023 because he has really been providing of late. And um, so we are, we are so excited about what is, God is getting ready to do. So thank you for that. Uh, I thought we would do a little something different today for prayers and praises because sometimes we look at the prayer requests and we don't really pray for those people. We're just like, yeah, be with everybody's on the prayer request list, you know? And it would be different if um, Sarah McMahon's friend, Krista G., who is a pastor, she and her husband, Kelly, are pastors in Iowa. Is that right, Sarah? She has stage four breast cancer or stage four cancer. And if she was lying here in a bed hooked to a bunch of machines and had that thing that was going, dee, 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 and nurses were taking vitals and they were giving her her stuff, if Carly McGee was here in the same way, we'd be praying for them fervently. That's the word that's used in James chapter 5, right? Is that fervently praying for them. So I want you to think about this is that we're going, I'm going to ask you to pray and then I'll close this. But I want you to think of David Paul, Margie's son, has. Uh, Huntington's is what they think he has now. They've thought ALS. They've been trying to figure it out. Remember, they had fluid on his brain and had stroke kind of effects. But so David Paul, if he was here, uh, Carly McGee, Krista G. Um, we would have um, Iris Daniels, um, Patsy's aunt, who has uh, open wounds and infection, and she's had a stroke. Uh, she lives in Georgia. Robin Jack, her cousin, has cancer. Uh, my friend Brooke Downing Wheeler, Donya Mullenix, which is Bob and, uh, Bob and Gloria Mullenix's daughter has cancer. Uh, uh, Chris, that we prayed for, Sarah's friend, you know, that had the, you know, he's had no brain activity. He's been in a nursing home with his, you know, we would consider that to be an impossible situation. And yet God is the God of the impossible. Uh, Mark O that we pray for, Ron's sister, Pat, Ron Owen's sister is still in the hospital. And then for Sarah's grandmother, who's got flu and, and pneumonia, uh, and her name's Betty. Uh, and do you have others that would be somebody like this that would need prayer today that you'd like to bring up at this time? Sam? Uh, my dad got a uh, pretty frustrating thing where his uh, doctor said, oh, we're scheduling you an emergency uh, appointment with an oncologist. Uh, but that emergency appointment was scheduled a month and a half ago for the 27th of this month. And he's just like, for what? And they wouldn't tell him. So he's just been sitting two months in, yeah. for two months in limbo. Yeah. Okay. So that's the same staff. Anybody else before we go to the Lord in prayer? So James chapter 5 says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. doesn't mean man means human. The prayer of a human is powerful and of a righteous human is powerful and effective. And all of us sitting here would go, well, that leaves me out because I'm not righteous. Actually, you are. If you're a Christian, the blood of Jesus makes you righteous in the eyes of God. And so I want us to bow our heads and to pray silently to yourself and um, lift up whoever God lays on your heart this morning. And I know that was a big, long list of folks. Um, but yes, James. Okay.
Yeah. Um, so let's bow our heads, and then I will close this. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes here in silence, and you lift up. I, I want you to believe. I want you to have the faith that God is listening. Mary told, you know, uh, she was sitting there asking the angel, how am I going to have this child of Jesus? And he said, with all things, with God, all things are possible. And so let's remember that. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, you have heard the, and you continue to hear the prayers of your people. Um, you have called us to pray. You said pray without ceasing. You tell us in John 14, 14 to ask anything in Jesus' name and it will be done. And we claim those promises today. We ask that you would hear us as we call out for all of these folks that we have mentioned here today. And I know Margie wrings her hands every day for David Paul um, and his health as her son. And I, I do pray for him. And each person that did, that's on this list in our newsletter and in our bulletin, those are all our family and our friends. Those are the people we care about the most in this world. We bring them to your feet because they may need jobs. They may need salvation. They may need their marriages fixed or they may need help with their kids. Um, we ask that you would bless uh, James and Ashlyn and Nora uh, and bless Ashlyn's pregnancy, Lord. Um, we ask that you would bless our church. Uh, that you would bless all of our folks um, who aren't here today that are traveling that you give them safe easy travel bless mark and marcy as they're helping renovate their son's home in, in clearwater florida and lord give us safe travel today as my family headed for knoxville for a day and, um, bless our service projects this week as well lord and um, at the people's table uh, come join us in this service lead this service today lord uh, prepare our hearts and minds to receive you in jesus name amen this time the children can come forward for the kids' message. They're like, we're in the middle of something back here, Chris. That's not near as bad. When I was a kid, my mom, they had to, uh, she was so embarrassed for a church service, I laid my head down in her lap when I was about Elijah's age, and I was snoring so loudly that the pastor stopped and looked at my mother, made her wake me up and take me out of the church service. So I've continued that by preaching in a way that helps you to sleep. Uh, <laughs> all right, so we are going to continue where we left off before Christmas. Elijah's like, it's a bunch of women up here. I've got to sit with all these women, right? I understand. Oh, brand new shoes. I like them. Those are neat. Mickey Mouse. We light up. I know. Light up tennis shoes. You were blessed for Christmas, weren't you? That's awesome. Um, we left off with um, Israel in need of a new king because King Saul is not was not a great king. And they're trying to pick a new king. And here's my question. How would you guys pick a new king? Well... God, they picked King Saul because he was tall and he looked like a big tough guy. He was muscular. You know, he was like Thor. He was that kind of a looking guy, right? He, he looked the part and he was a pretty lousy king, right? So this time they're looking for a different king and they go to Jesse's house. And Jesse has seven sons. And so he's sitting there and Samuel is the prophet and God says, go there and I'll show you who's going to be king. And he goes to the first son, the oldest son. And all of a sudden standing there and boy, Samuel goes, look at that guy. That guy's huge. You know, that guy really looks like a military leader. He's big, strong. God goes, nope, it's not him. So he goes to the second one and the third one and the fourth one. And God's going, nope, 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 nope. Goes through all seven. 
And God's sitting there going, no, not any of those. And so Samuel goes, we're out of sons. We don't have any more. And God says, ask Jesse. He said, do you have any other sons? And Jesse goes, just the one little one that's out in the, you know, watching the sheep right now. And Samuel goes, bring him in. So they bring him in and he's all dirty, smells bad, Nori. You know, he's been out working and everything like your dad out in the yard coming in, you know, get a drink of water. And so he comes in and Samuel kind of looks at him and he goes, that's going to be the new king, that guy right there. What if it was Elijah? What if he was his age? And he goes, no, there's our new king right there, right? It's just a little guy just been out watching the sheep, right? It's the youngest son. He doesn't look the part. And God says these words. I'm not like human beings. I don't look at the external appearance, the way somebody looks. I look at their heart. And that's why he chose David. And that's why David was such a great king. And so for us, our job then, because God says, hey, imitate me, do what I do, right? Come follow me and do what I do. So when we go to school or we go to daycare or we go to a family get together or practice ball or practice singing or soccer or whatever we do, dance, and we walk in and we see somebody, what they look like really doesn't matter. We need to get to know them and figure out what their heart is like before we judge them and say, I want to be friends with them. I don't want to be friends with them. You know, that's, that's the thing that God is calling us to today. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for Christmas and all the stuff that we got, all the things that we were able to give, gifts to our friends and family. And uh, we ask your blessing on these sweet children. Uh, thank you for the child that Ashlyn carries. And we ask, Lord, that you would bless our children's church, that you would bless each family in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys did awesome today. Good job. Way to go. You can follow Miss Sela and go there if you want. And Sam is going to come and sing for us. enough to be the one who's praying and absolutely uh, God did so much to make us righteous he came down served in flesh so that he could die and make us righteous right and the really good part about that is he defeated that death and came back but uh, this is all about that sacrifice Thank you.
enthroned upon my praises, and clothed in majesty, he is holy. There's been times when we're riding in the car down here to church, Margie will call and say, Ron is sick or something's going on. I can't be here today. This is like, you know, an hour or two before service is supposed to happen. And I go to Jill, um, would you sing something today? We're driving in the car to go to church, right? And she's like, oh yeah, sure. And she doesn't just fall back and don't hear her sing the same song 500 times, right? She picks something out and she does whatever God that's blessed. I'm just going to tell you, that is completely blessed. We have all this, this talent. People do this, and they're praying about what they're supposed to sing, and, and it just blows me away. Um, we are going to be in Mark uh, chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 19 through 24. So if you would turn there with me. Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to talk about our eyesight today and what that does for us. Um, as you're turning there, uh, I want to tell you a quick story about my son who was in Texas visiting a girlfriend's family. And so he's in Dallas, Texas, and they went out to eat, he and his girlfriend and the family. They're all sitting in a restaurant, and Noah's looking across the restaurant, and it's just a regular life. I mean, it's... You know, it's a local place, but it's, it's just a regular restaurant, like an Applebee's or something like that, right? So they look across, and Noah's going, he's talking to his girlfriend, he's like, is that John Manziel sitting at that table over there? Who was the quarterback for Texas A&M at one time. And he's, you know, Noah really liked Johnny Manziel. He was a really well-known SEC quarterback. His team was really good. And so Noah's like, and she's, his girlfriend goes, I think that is him. And so Noah's like, I'm going to go over and say hi and ask for autographs. And she goes, don't bother him, he's eating, you know, don't, don't, don't do that. He goes, I'll wait till he finishes, and before he gets up, I'll go over there and see if he'll sign me an autograph, because he really liked this guy. And he wasn't going to sell it, he was going to put it on display, right, in his, in his room or his office. So at the end of, you can see they're kind of finishing up, it's, it's Johnny and another guy he's sitting there with, and Noah walks over, and he's standing at the table, and he kind of just goes, are you Johnny Menzel? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, would you, uh, would you be willing to uh, 
sign this autograph for me? I'm sorry to disturb you. I know you guys have been having this meal. <laughs> Would you sign this? Johnny signs it for him, and Noah comes back over to the table, and he's going. Shows it to everybody. Johnny Manziel. Johnny Manziel right there. Whatever. And the girlfriend's dad goes, who's the guy he's with? And Noah goes, I don't know, some other guy. And he goes, I think that's Vaughn Miller. He's, oh. he's the... The defensive player of the year in the NFL, Super Bowl champ. He, you actually got a guy who didn't make it in the NFL's autograph, and the other guy sitting with him was one of the best players in NFL history, and you didn't get his autograph. No, it's going, you know, like that thing. But what did he see? He saw what he wanted to see. He saw Johnny Manziel sitting there, so he went to get his autograph, and he still loves it that he got his autograph, but he didn't get Vaughn Miller's autograph, and he didn't even speak to Vaughn Miller. In fact, he ignored Vaughn Miller uh, to get Johnny Manziel's autograph. So, uh, which I thought was just hilarious. So let's talk about what we see. Let's talk about our eyes here. So beginning in verse 19, chapter 6, it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures um, on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, Let's, let's talk about our eyesight for a second in terms of what we see. Now, if you grew up on a farm, why did you put blinders on your horse or on your mule or your donkey? Why, why the blinders? Why when you go to Churchill Downs to go watch the biggest horse race of the year, do they have blinders on these animals? What's the point? Distractions. Distractions. How we see stuff. And have you ever noticed, if you're anything like me, that what I feel like happens to me every day is that Satan has these carrots on a stick. You know, if he had a mule or a donkey that was really stubborn and wouldn't do anything, they used to put a stick out in front of it with a string on it, and it would have a vegetable on the end of it, and you put it out in front of the animal to get him to move forward. That was a way of getting him to move. Well, in our lives, I believe those distractions sometimes come as these carrots, the imaginary metaphorical carrots that are out in front of us. And we go, okay, this is what I'm going to do today. I'm going here. And then that carrot comes in. And we go, oh, look at that. Oh, wow. Look at that. And we take off walking in a completely different direction. We get wheeled down this rabbit hole. We chase this squirrel, right? We're starting to sound like hound dogs, but that's not what I'm talking about. You understand the metaphor is that we all get distracted and it depends on how you see things. Okay, so let's let's look at this. Okay, so everybody turn with me to Numbers 13 in your, you know, back Old Testament. Everybody's like, he's preaching from Numbers? I don't know that we've ever had a sermon from Numbers. But actually, we there's lots of good stuff in Numbers. It's not just who begat who. Numbers 13, beginning in the, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably start. Uh, I'll maybe read the first verse and I'm going to skip down because it does start talking about who from what tribe and all that. So Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, if you're going from the front of the Bible. It says in verse 1, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. And he sends one from each of the twelve tribes. And they're listed there for you in those next verses. If you jump down to verse 16, it says, um, uh, or 17, it says, When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. Okay. So let's skip down to 21, and it says, So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin and as far as Rahab toward Lebo Hamath. They went up through the Negev, that's a desert, and came to Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. Um, Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshcol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and figs. That place they called the valley of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. 
They came back in to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community of Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. Uh, remember we talked about milk and honey being, uh, that, that tells you it was a tremendously uh, flourishing land because that means there was lots of, if there's lots of milk, that means there's lots of animals, cattle, camels, donkeys, sheep, goats, those kind of things. Those things have to have grass and, you know, all the different uh, types of wheat and all those, all those things, right? That, that means those things are growing. And if it's flowing with honey, that means there's lots of bees, which means they are, you know, doing the flowers, pollinating everything. And so it's really a good place. That's what it says, flowing with milk and honey. It's, it's awesome. And so uh, it went into the land in which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit, but the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. Keep that in mind, right? How many of y'all been to New York City? First time when you walked through New York City, what was it like? Especially if you grew up in Santa Fe or you grew up in Bonn or you grew up in, uh, you know, small town Tennessee. Oh my goodness. That was the most daunting thing to me in the whole world is seeing those big, huge buildings. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. It says that they're stronger than we are. Now, Margie, do you think that they stopped long enough and went over there and said, Okay, we're going to arm wrestle. Let's put it right here, big man. Let's see what you got. Let's see if you're stronger than me, right? Or they were like in a ring going, all right, let's see who's stronger, me or you. No, they simply looked at them and determined, you look stronger than me. Does that mean they were stronger? Please understand that. If you've ever played sports in your life, Catherine coaches a team right now. If you walk out on the floor in a basketball game and the other team is a foot taller than you in every way, you assume they're going to beat you. You don't know how they play basketball, but you're going, I think we're going to have trouble today. These are some pretty big girls that we're playing, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's that what we see is not necessarily the truth. And so it says they're stronger than we are, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there of great size. We saw the Nephilim there with descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked uh, the same to them. What is God's will for them? What did God tell them clearly and communicate to them in a loving and kind way? What should they have done? Go. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? Step one, go. Go into the promised land. That's what he had said. I prepared it for you. It's going to be your land. Go. Go. They, with their own eyes, looked in it, and what did they decide? Look at the next verse, verse 14, verse 1, chapter 14, verse 1. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? They've just looked around. That's all they've done. And yet, that's what we do every single day. But whether it's possible for God to fix this person or this situation, we look at it and we make assessments based upon the limited amount of knowledge that we may have or experience that we may have. And we say, God's not big enough to fix this. And yet, when Mary is sitting there and she knows without a doubt that she's not had relations with a man at all, and the angel comes and says, you're getting ready to have a kid, she says to him, how is that possible? And he says, with God, all things are possible. And so for us, when we have to be careful how we use our eyes because when God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach, he says, I want you to go there because those folks are really lost. Jonah says... No, 
And he gets a ticket, goes and buys the ticket to get on a ship and goes in the opposite direction to a place that is known for what? What is Tarshish known for? Number one thing, gold. It's the place where you, they mined gold in the old world. Why would you go to the place where they mined gold? It's flourishing. There's lots of good stuff there. Your economy is doing well. The people are, you know, there's, there's a chance to get rich there, Ted. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we can, that's why he's going. It's the distraction. Let's go here. It's the same thing we do. The world, you know, we look around and we go, mm, let's go move. Uh, let's go get something. Uh, right? I mean, that's what we do is that we escape to that, right? And that's what Jonah is doing. But why? Why did Jonah do that? Why did he go there and say no to God? Because when he looked with his eyes... He saw the people that had just defeated the Israelites. They had put his family and friends' heads on stakes all along the road in their version of shock and awe to scare the living daylights out of anybody else that would come up against them. And so he said, I hate those people and there's a risk that they're going to hurt me because I've seen with my own eyes what they did to my family and friends. And he said, no. In our lives, we miss blessings so much because we look and we say, mm, I don't think so. Or we look with our eyes and we see, right? Now, you all have heard me say this, is that when Jill and I were looking for houses in Knoxville, Tennessee, she and I were looking online and the internet because there were so many houses for sale. At the time, the market was nothing like it is right now. Uh, people were hurting trying to sell their houses. And so she and I were looking and we saw this one at this auction and we went, oh, that's a great house. It's beautiful. And Jill goes, we might be able to get that house someday. That would be awesome. We could pay, put a bid on that house. And we're just kind of like that warm feeling of it's a home and we're going to have, you know. And we get in there and we decide this is how much we can bid on this house. And we get in there and we're, we're like, we're not going to go a dollar over this amount. We're not going to get caught up in the auction. And, you know, Lord, please let us have this house for this amount. We're your people. Chris is a pastor. I work at a church with him. We're good people. We deserve this home. Oh, come on. You've said those words. I attend church every Sunday, Lord. I'm a faithful member of the discipleship Sunday school class, right? I mean, and we get in there and the auction starts going and it's going and going and going. We're bidding. It's going up. We're bidding. It's going up. And it gets up to what we said was our top, real top. Jill's sitting there and I hit that last. That's it. And she goes, Somebody bid one, one level higher. And she goes, okay, go one more. And I went $1,000 more than what we had said. And then it just kept going and kept going. And it sold for like 50-something thousand dollars above what we were willing to pay. And Jill goes, I could, hear the, I could hear the, you know, that disappointment sigh that you do. And we both were like, Lord, that would seem like the perfect house. It was just the perfect opportunity in such and such neighborhood and all this other kind of stuff. Year more passes. Celia comes home. It's Christmas time. Just like what we celebrated. And she goes, Dad, I want to do some fun tonight. And I said, what? She goes, I want to go look at some houses that are decorated up and everything and see them. I, I love looking at the lights. I want us to go see this in these neighborhoods. I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. Let's go. She goes, I've heard of this one house. We have to go see it. And I said, cool. She goes, it's not far from here. And I'm like, okay. And so we, she starts telling us, turn here, turn here, turn here. And I was like, Jill, I think this is that neighborhood where that house we were trying to buy is, right? I mean, we, we tried to buy online. And she's like, oh yeah, that was the name of the neighborhood. We, we get ready to turn in and there's traffic at the road. You can't turn into the neighborhood. It's a subdivision, just like some of you all live in. It's just like Cherry Grove, right? That you're right there and you can't turn on Campbell Station because the traffic is backed up to there. And you're like, what's going on here? And we do the... And we go all the way to the back of this neighborhood and I go, hey, this is... And, and I'm looking, and the house that we tried to buy is sitting right here in the cul-de-sac. And directly across the cul-de-sac is this other house that is decorated like the Griswolds. And it has 52 of those blow-up things in the yard. And it's going, it's a small world. And it's going, Mary Brother, it does rain here. And I mean, it's blinking and it's flashing and there's lights and noise. And every car is sitting there. And kids like Nora are going, look at this house. And you can't even get out of the driveway of the house that we were, were going to buy. And Celia goes, been like this for weeks. And I was like, dear Lord, thank you so much that we didn't buy this home and that we would be stuck in it across the street from the Griswolds, right? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Is that that would have been a nightmare to live in that neighborhood because the traffic was gridlocked in there all the time during the holidays. And I'm thinking, oh, I 
mean, I was, I was like mad at God because he didn't let us have that house that we wanted, right? And God says, hey, we ought to put those blinders on if we can. We ought to get those attached to the sides of our heads so you can actually do what I tell you to do, right? You say you're my personal representative, Chris Caldwell, but you're getting kind of off track here and off track here and off track here because of what our eyes tell us. I stood yesterday at the FCA, uh, they had a thing called Courts for Christ yesterday, a basketball event in Lewisburg, and I was down there, and they had all these kids there, and all these youth and adults, and, and they said, uh, we're going to have a guy come up and give his testimony, and his name's David Walker. Well, David Walker is who spoke at our bowling event that we had down at Tin Pen back on the 16th of December. He's an FCA intern, and I knew his story, but then he starts talking, and he grew up in foster care. David is 20 years old. He is from now from Waynesboro is where he lives. And, um, but he grew up going from home to home. Somebody would take him for a while, give him back. Take him for a while, give him back. And he finally got a family. Can you imagine what it would feel like to be adopted by a family finally? He gets adopted and he's, I think he said it was like third or fourth grade. And this family lives in Texas and so he's there and he moves in. And before long, he's getting the beating of a lifetime. And he's, he doesn't know any better. He doesn't know that this is not what happens in a regular family. And they are physically abusing him. I mean, beating, beating him. And they always beat him in a place and stuff so they can hide it with whatever, a t-shirt or something underneath a shirt to keep the bruises out of sight and all that. And finally, they, they move around each year so that nobody can get on that they're abusing their kids. Nobody, the school system can't seem to figure it out fast enough. So they move and they get to Waynesboro and he's in like uh, eighth grade at that point. And the football coach at Waynesboro, when they moved down there, goes, you're a big dude. Why don't you come play football for us? We're terrible. We need, a, we need some more bodies. We need some big guys like you to come play for us. And he said, okay. And he comes in and the first few days of practice, he goes into a stall and puts on his football gear in the bathroom, right? And all the guys are like, kind of shy there. And he's a little shy putting on his stuff, but he did it every day. And then finally, there is after one of the games that they had, he took off his shoulder pads and his, his shirt was soaking wet. He just jerked it off, put on a different shirt. And when he took it off, there's all these bruises on his back. And they're like, man, you took a beating tonight. You got bruises on your back from that game, man. You really, you really were in the heart of it. You really, right? He's like, yeah. Puts it on. So some of the other things go on, and he gets a little more comfortable, so he's changing, you know, doing different stuff through the year. And finally, a coach goes, that bruise right there would not have been from anything that we did today in practice or the game that we had. Are you okay? Yeah, 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 coach, I'm good, I'm good. Well, the coach goes and tells the guidance counselor. And the guidance counselor is a woman, and she says, hey, David, would you come into my office for a second? And she and the principal were in there, and she said, hey, I just had a question for you. She's got a lot of bruises, as the coaches saw, and um, so can, can, can you show us that the bruise on your back? And he's like, no, oh, it's nothing. It's football. And they go, well, just show it to us or whatever. And he takes it off, and there's all these bruises where he's been beaten on his back, all these welts, all these different places. And they pull him out of that family because he's being physically abused. And he knew no better. And when they pulled him out, he said, I got put in another family. And he goes, it was like night and day. He said, they didn't beat me at all. He said, they were a loving family. They were kind to me. He said, I just didn't know any better. And he said, you know, and he goes, if that one coach hadn't told the guidance counselor, I'd still be in that situation. Now, when the coach saw those bruises, what could, remember, what did he see with his eyes? What could he have done? Football. Tough and jet. Look at the bruises on that man. He's out there still giving his all for the team. You got to love a guy like that, right? Or he could have gone, oh, his dad's a little rough on him, you know, but this is, you know, Tennessee, and man's allowed to, I guess, spank his kids, and something must have happened, and, right? Um, you know? Or he could have gone, man, this kid's being abused, but I'm not getting in the middle of that because I don't want to get in some kind of legal situation. I don't know what that means for my job. I don't know what that means for him. I'd hate to get him in more trouble with his dad than he is right now and get him hurt even more than he is. Aren't those all things that could have gone through that coach's head? And instead, he took the risk and he said, David, 
I'm going to help you. Let's go talk to the guidance counselor. And that helped him to get out of that situation. The world that we live in is a terrible place at times. And we have a role in it in that we're supposed to be Jesus' representatives out in that world. We're supposed to be shining like stars in the universe, in the midst of the darkness that we go into. And that means we're supposed to have an impact for Jesus, an impact in people's lives. Our testimony should follow us into all of those situations. And the problem is, is that at times we do two things. We walk into a situation where God says, yes, I want you right here. And we go, oh my goodness, look at that 85 inch TV. That is the most, I don't know. Does that thing have, Sam, does that have two HDMIs or is that, can you hook up? I don't, I, I want to know, okay, so is that 120 hertz or 60 hertz or is it 240 hertz? Because I need to know the refresh rate and the contrast ratio for that TV. Um, I'm going to have to really research this and do some, I'm going to have to figure that out. And God says, over here, I was having to look here, look here, not, right? And we get off track doing, you know, whatever it might be. And we miss it because of the distractions that are out there. So there's that that's going on and it's so easy for us to get distracted, right? I mean, it really is so easy. The other one is, is that we see it and we go, I'm afraid of that, Lord. The fear within me is swelling up and I don't know if I'm willing to take that chance to help in that situation. I'm not willing to go into the promised land. I know what you said, Lord, but those people are seven feet tall. They all look like Shaquille O'Neal and they, they all look like Goliath. And Lord, um, they're all big, giant guys. I'm afraid to do that. I'm afraid. How, how many of y'all have been in a situation where you've sat in a room full of people and somebody, there's two or three people talking and they're saying terrible, awful things. They're talking bad about somebody and we go, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to anybody. I don't want to start an argument. I don't want to be in conflict, right? And then we walk away without doing anything and it continues. It continues. And so for us, we're sitting here and we're, we're talking about in our lives, what impact have we made for Jesus in this world? When William Carey was in India, and I'll leave you with this. Infanticide was going on the day his ship pulled in. That means that at certain times of the year, people would take their newborn baby and they would throw it into the Ganges River where the crocodiles would tear it apart. And that was part of a fertility ritual in case you were trying to have your crops really produce a hundredfold this year. That was part of the ritual in their, what they did. And he went, I can't live knowing that that's going on. And they did sati where, you know, if, you, if you're as a husband, if I died, they attached Jill alive to me. They tied her down to me and they set us both on a funeral pyre and killed her. That was called sati. And that went on. And that when they went to their temples, they had these kids that were called devadesis, devadesis. And those were child prostitutes that you could buy while you were at the temple as part of your worship. And he looked around him and what could he have done? The beauty of India. Look at the Taj Mahal. Isn't that an amazing place? And oh my goodness, look at the tigers over here. And look at this beautiful land and the geography of it all. And I'm going to go translate the Bible because that's what I came here for and do nothing about these things. Could have done that, right? Instead, he started writing and speaking and having lunch and talking to people who have in, were of influence and saying, we can't allow this to go on as godly people, as representatives of Jesus in this world. We can't allow these things to continue because what about that baby that's getting tossed? What about that particular kid that's getting sold as a devadesis into the temple? What about that wife? She's a human being that's getting tied and thrown into that fire. What about them? We have to fight on their behalf. And in that moment, it pays to have somebody who has the faith of William Carey and says, I'll go. I'll do it. I'll speak up. I'll write. I'll stand in the gap for this person. <coughs> That's who God is calling us to be. He's calling us in the midst of situations where marriages are breaking up to sit and listen to the husband or the wife, to be able to give wise and sage advice, to be able to pray for them, for people who are sick, for situations where people are out of money, for situations where people are lame, dying. God has said, I need you in this. No, he doesn't need us. He wants us there to grow our faith. He wants us there because he wants to work through us and he gets all the glory. He uses weak things to do amazing things. 
And that's who we are. We are his people. We're supposed to be about his business in the world. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day. And I, I pray, Lord, that we would see the world with new eyes. That we would see the possibilities rather than the negatives. That we would see in people the possibilities. When we walk in a room, we would see people that need to hear about Jesus. We'd see people that we could be friends with, people that we could help, people that would be support and encouragement for us instead of people who are our enemies, people who aren't like us that we dislike. And Lord, help us to see that way, to see what's important. Help us to be able to get past the things that are shiny and glittery and to go to the heart of the things that are of you. Lord, help us to serve only you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're getting ready to uh, sing our concluding song. It's in its Waymaker. And so um, Sam is going to lead us, and I'm going to ask you to stand and sing. They gave out these little bracelets yesterday at the uh, FCA event, and it has four little boxes on it. One is a heart, uh, which represents that God loves us. And then it's got a, a divide there, a divide symbol. And it says... That our sin divided us from God. It separated us from God. And then the third one is a little box that has a cross in it. It's a gift, a free gift to us, but we have to open that gift. We have to say, I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And then the last one is a question mark about what are you going to do when God hands you that box? Are you going to accept that gift or are you going to turn away from it? And so today you have the opportunity to become a Christian, to join the church, to come and pray about whatever God has laid on your heart. But we come as we sing together, Waymaker. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. 
stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop. Even when, even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. Never stop, never stop working. opportunity to go to the people's table and serve a, uh, cook and serve a meal for the homeless and that's Tuesday and with Bob and Myrtle if you would like to be a part of that and come join them remember um, my friends Randy and Leah uh, their church did uh, bags of food for the homeless for folks that were in need and so there are levels that you could participate in that program Ryan might come to you and say hey we're doing this would you give them a check you might write a check, and that's your involvement in that program, right? Or Ryan might say, hey, come, and we're going to pack bags, or uh, Sarah and I, we're going to go buy groceries. We come help us buy the groceries. You know, somebody, we have money now. We're going to buy the groceries and get it all ready. So you might be able to do that. Then you might be able to meet at the church and pack the bags, right? Pack up these bags, and then we're going to take phone calls. So we need some people to answer the phones when people call and say they're in need. And then we need to deliver these bags. And you're going to meet the people who get the food if you're at this point. And Randy and Leah kind of did all of those steps. And they finally got to the point where they said, I'd like to meet some of the people that we're giving food to and pray with them or be able to talk to them about, is there a way I can help them out of that situation? And so Leah said, I'm going to go. And she and a, another lady, they partnered up and they went out to deliver some bags. And they were going to apartments and houses and all this stuff. And they go to different ones and they go into this one house and they carry in these groceries and it's a single mom of five children. The lady is obviously addicted to heroin. And the five children she has with five different men. And she has these kids in this house. And the kids are emaciated. They've not been fed in a while. They're not being cared for. They're not being bathed. They barely have anything to wear. And Leah starts getting involved with that family. Trying to help the mother be able to survive. Help her get help. Help her to get into a rehab and all of this. And over the course of about six months, the lady makes it clear, I don't want help. I don't want to go to rehab. I'm good the way that I am. And over the course of the next six months, the state intervenes and starts taking her kids away from her. And the, she gets arrested and put in jail for using. And so, and during the course of all of this, Randy and Leah adopt two of the children Two go to different family members of theirs. Another gets adopted by a social worker. And those kids are raised with Randy and Leah. What was the difference in those kids' lives between single mom of five with five different dads who's a heroin addict versus living with my friends in a neighborhood, being loved and cared for, worked for their best interest, going to school, going to ball games, going to choir things, Night and day. Night and day difference. 
because they were willing to step out and go where God had sent them and to be willing. And that's where we sit today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to go uh, serve a meal for the homeless. And I hope that we all just won't stay in the kitchen. And I know these, this group, they don't do that. But, it, you know, it's easy for a group to go do this and stay in the kitchen all together and talk and, and all that stuff and never meet the people that you're serving food to. Never meet the folks that are walking the streets or living underneath the bridge or in the cardboard box or in the flop house. People that are addicted, people that are broken. And Lord, I pray that we would invest in their lives because how on earth are they going to get out of that if they don't have somebody help them? They don't have somebody that reaches out to help pull them up. And Lord, I pray that you would give us that kind of eyesight to be able to see the outcast and the broken, those that nobody else sees, those that are faceless, and to be able to love them in spite of who they are. Because that's what you did for us. You loved us in spite of who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week and Happy New Year to you.